the Huns played an instrumental part in destroying the Western Roman Empire. The Avars brought the Eastern Roman Empire to almost the same fate. The Khazars stopped Arab expansion across the Caucasus while in the process drastically weakening the Umayyad Caliphate, and the nomads of the Mongol steppe were such a threat to China that numerous Chinese dynasties all across the ages spent enormous amounts of resources on large wall building projects just to keep the nomads out. It is undeniable that the early medieval nomads of the Eurasian steppe had a tremendous impact on Eurasian history, and therefore it would be nice to know how these nomads lived in the steppe, especially since a lot of what we know about them isn't very accurate. Before we delve into the complicated life of the early medieval Eurasian steppe quote unquote nomads, we have to talk about the polities that existed in the steppe during this time just to give some background. We will start off in the 6th century with the first Turkic Kaganate. There were many nomadic polities before then, but we have to start off somewhere and the first Turkic Kaganate is a perfect starting point as it gave rise to many nomadic groups that influenced Eurasian politics for the rest of the medieval period. The first Turkic Kaganate emerged after the Gokturks, an early Turkic tribe, successfully rebelled against their Ruran overlords and took control of their state in 552. Subsequently, the Gokturks went on to conquer much of the Eurasian steppe. The Gokturks came as far as the Byzantine controlled Crimea in 576 and even laid siege to the city of Chersonesus, today Sevastopol. The Avars that came to Pannonia during the 6th century and established the Avar Kaganet were fleeing from the Gokturk conquest. There is a theory that the Avars were the Ruran that were defeated by the Gokturks and fled west. However, this is hard to prove. The Avars could have easily been one of the many nomadic tribes in the steppe that just didn't want to get conquered by the first Turkic Kaganet. Nonetheless, wherever they came from, the Avars, along the way to Pannonia, subdued the Bulgar tribes living around the Don River. In circa 584, a succession crisis in the first Turkic Kaganate led to a civil war which lasted until 603, when the civil war got resolved by splitting the Kaganate into two parts, the Western Turkic Kaganate and the Eastern Turkic Kaganate. The Eastern Turkic Kaganate was then subdued by the Tang dynasty in 630, becoming their vassals. In the West, the Bulgars rebelled against the Avars in 632, established Establishing the Old Great Bulgaria. During that time, with the fall of the Eastern Turkic Kaganate, the Western Turkic Kaganate wasn't faring any better, and in around the 630s, it started to lose control over the various nomadic tribes living within its borders. The most notable of these tribes were the Khazars. The Khazars broke off from the control of the Western Turkic Kaganate at some point between 630 and 650, consolidating power south of the Volga River. Once they emerged as a consolidated polity, they started to look outwards trying to conquer the Bulgars to the west, the Kangar Union to the east, and also fighting the Arabs to the south. The Kangar Union was a collection of various nomadic tribes that, under the leadership of the Kangars, rebelled against the western Turkic Kaganate when it was invaded and subdued by the Tang dynasty in 657. In 668, after the death of their Kagan, the old great Bulgaria finally succumbed to the Khazars with some of the Bulgars migrating north and establishing Volga Bulgaria and some migrating west and establishing the first Bulgarian kingdom. In 682, the Gokturks of the eastern Turkic Kaganet, who were the vassals of the Tang, successfully rebelled against the Chinese and started to consolidate power in the steppe once again. In 712, they conquered what remained of the western Turkic Kaganet, which was now called the Turgish Kaganet, as the Turgish took control of the Kaganet away from the Gokturks. With this conquest of the Turgish Kaganet, the Gokturks of the eastern Turkic Kaganet formed what we call today the the Second Turkic Kaganate. During the formation of the Second Turkic Kaganate, the Gokturks violently subdued a nomadic tribe called the Uyghurs who subsequently started to plot against them. Also, around the late 7th century, the Umayyad forces took control of the Amu and Sirdaria rivers away from the Kangar Union and in the early 8th century, the Arabs came into conflict with the Tang Empire over the valuable trading area of Sogdia. This fighting was marked with frequent involvement of the various local nomadic tribes from the Second Turkic Kaganet, most notably the Turgesh and the Ogus. In 744, the Uyghurs, now with new allies, led a rebellion against the Gokturks and overthrew them, ending the Second Turkic Kaganet. Subsequently, the Uyghurs established a new nomadic polity known as the Uyghur Kaganet. As part of consolidating power within the new Kaganet, the Uyghurs attacked one of their allies that helped them overthrow the Gokturks, the Karluks. After this attack, the Karluks migrated west to the land of the Ogus and the Turgesh, who they defeated and took control of their land. The Turgesh assimilated 
assimilated into the Karluks, while the defeated Ogus had no choice but to migrate west into the Kangar Union. There, the Ogus allied with the Kimaks, who were under Kangar control, and overthrew the Kangars. The defeated Kangars united with the remaining tribes still loyal to them and formed a new tribe called the Pechenegs. The Pechenegs subsequently migrated westwards, fighting off the Khazars and settling around the Ural River. The victorious Ogus and Kimaks then divided the Kangar lands and formed their own polities in the area in circa 750. These polities were called the Kimak Kaganet and the Ogus Yapku state. Ogus also managed to reconquer some parts of the Sirdaria river from the Arabs and the Uyghurs managed to get hold of some Sogdian trading cities. This is where I will end the very oversimplified summary of the early medieval Eurasian steppe. Keep in mind that the sources about this area and this period are very sparse and therefore the details of these events are very much still debated today by historians. Due to that, some historians may present slightly different versions of events that occurred in this area during this time, especially when it comes to territorial control of the various polities mentioned as that is probably one of the hardest things to pinpoint. With that said, now that you're more confused than ever about the history of the Eurasian steppe, we can delve into the lifestyle of the people that lived in this land of constant flux. But not before I tell you about this video's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access, the most transparent VPN provider with over 30 million downloads. I have actually been using Private Internet Access personally for over two years now, and I like how it helps me protect my data from my ISP and access geo-restricted content. What drew me into using Private Internet Access as a personal VPN was the fact that they're very unique. Even though they protect your private data through the fact that they are a VPN, many VPN companies still log your activity and I have always found that very counterintuitive. However, private internet access doesn't do this. They have a strict policy about not storing any of your data, which has even been tested in court. What's more, the app is 100% open source, so you can see for yourself if you wanted to that private internet access doesn't keep any tabs on you. Add to that the fact that private internet access is available on all platforms, Windows, Android, iOS, and Linux, or that you can use one subscription to protect 10 different devices and you have a great product. Not to mention that its UI is really easy to use. I mean, I can use it, and I'm a historian. So if you want to join me and start using private internet, now is the perfect time because there is a massive discount available for you. Click the link in the description and get private internet access for 83% off. That's just $2.08 a month. And you also get two extra months for free. Plus, you're protected by a 30-day money-back guarantee. And customer support is available 24-7, so signing up is risk-free. And I definitely recommend it. Thank you to private internet access for sponsoring this video. Now that we have discussed the various steppe polities of the early medieval period and the way they were established and destroyed, we can discuss more closely the life of the steppe nomads that lived in these polities. When people picture the history of the Eurasian steppe, they often picture an endless sea of grasslands filled with nomads living in yurts that sporadically follow their animal herds wherever they happen to migrate. These nomads then intermittently formed into bigger political groups and marched into the civilized world where they caused chaos and destruction. This picture, however, is filled with stereotypes and isn't very accurate. The nomads of the Eurasian steppe could build up or destroy powerful empires, they could form complex social hierarchies and even build cities the splendor of which impressed their local sedentary counterparts. None of this could be done by a society which solely centered around herding and migrating. The early medieval nomadic societies of the Eurasian steppe were far more complex than is often talked about. Probably the most important thing to mention here is that the Eurasian steppe in the early medieval period did have urban centers or at least settlements. Of course, these were on average smaller than the urban centers of China or Persia and there were less of them, but they did exist. The Eurasian steppe was not some kind of a sea of never-ending grasslands with no farming or settlements or urban centers. The trading cities on the Sirdaria river are well documented, as are the Khazar trading cities on the Volga and Don, and the Uyghur capital was said to have 
have been so magnificent it could rival any city in the urbanized world. Even in today's northern Kazakhstan, an area believed to have been devoid of any urbanization, a 9th century Arab explorer, Tamin ibn Bahr, wrote of Kimak villages and cultivated tracts of land around the Irtish river. As you can see, the early medieval Eurasian steppe contained settled people who farmed and also urban centers that produced goods, materials and traded with the rest of the world. Yes, there most certainly were a majority of nomads in the steppe that did live a life dictated by sporadic seasonal migrations of their herds, but this was by far not the only lifestyle present in the steppe, nor was this lifestyle static for the people that lived it. By that I mean the nomads weren't always nomadic. People who lived a nomadic life in the steppe could and did embrace a sedentary lifestyle either by choice or when social, economic and political pressures forced them into it. For example, the Khazars found themselves in control of the extremely valuable Volga and Don River trade routes and to consolidate control over this trade, they constructed and settled in cities along the rivers. The Khazars were nomads who, forced by political and economic pressures, had to consolidate power by becoming, at least in part, sedentary. This is not to say that all Khazars became sedentary. For example, the Khazar ruling class was said to have only wintered in their capital of Attil. And there were Khazar people that did continue on herding in the southern Russian steppe. But it does go to show that nomads could and did sometimes embrace sedentary lifestyles. In contrast to that, settled people in the steppe, who might have been former nomads themselves, could also abandon a settled or an urban life and become nomads again. This happened when the Gokturk Kagan of the Second Turkic Kaganate attacked the Uyghurs. He stated that, I marched down along the Selenga river and there laid waste to their Uyghur settlements further stating that Uyghurs dispersed mostly east but also west. The Uyghur settlements were destroyed and so the Uyghurs had to go back to a nomadic life in the steppe, biding their time and finding new allies before attacking the Gokturks and destroying their Kaganet as we already talked about. Hopefully with these examples it has become clear that a nomadic steppe life wasn't stagnant. It could involve months, years or even generations of sedentary existence before reverting back to nomadic herding or vice versa. The nomads of the Eurasian steppe were not foreign to the ideas of farming or settling in an urban center. They were also aware that successfully running a polity required some sort of centralized leadership, administration and management. This is why when new nomadic polities came to be, like that of the Khazar or the Uyghur Kaganet, the nomads knew they had to construct cities and so they did. However, this centralization, urbanization and settlement was not always successful or welcomed by some members of the nomadic communities within newly formed polities. For example, there was a very prominent Gokturk general in the second Turkic Kaganet called Tonyukuk who vehemently believed that the only way for them, the nomadic Turks, to maintain their national identity was to follow the water and the grass, meaning a nomadic lifestyle, and have no permanent dwellings. If the Turks were to change their old customs, he argued, one day they would be defeated and annexed by the Chinese. Thanks to people like Tonyukuk, we know that the idea of a nomadic life, versus a settled life, was a subject of debate in nomadic communities. Therefore, as with almost everything, the nomadic life of the Eurasian steppe was a spectrum with people people on one side arguing for a settled life and urban centers and people on the other for a nomadic life. Most nomads most likely fell somewhere in between these two extremes, which is why we see a variety of lifestyles in the Eurasian steppe and why a nomadic life was fluid and could contain nomads settling in cities and then also due to a variety of reasons abandoning these cities and becoming nomads again. Another aspect of the Eurasian steppe nomads that is often misrepresented is their autarky, in other words their self-sufficiency. The nomads of the Eurasian steppe were not at all autarkic. On the contrary, they needed a steady stream of goods like pottery or silk and raw materials like iron or wood from sedentary societies. The nomads simply just couldn't get hold of or produce all these goods in big enough quantities and therefore relied on sedentary societies. 
There were several ways the nomads acquired these goods and materials from these sedentary societies. First was from the urban centers that already existed in the Eurasian steppe. In fact, one of the theories for why there were settlements in the Eurasian steppe is that they were created to fulfill an economic need. This is, however, still debated. Second way of getting these goods and materials was through just trading. This is partly why nomads were often so keen on exploiting trade routes like the Khazars did and why why they often tried to conquer areas significant for trading like the Silk Road. Third was raiding urban centers, or through coercion of tribute payments of goods and materials to not raid these urban centers. Pretty self-explanatory. Fourth was conquering sedentary societies and then exploiting them, kind of like the Avars did with the Slavs or the Uyghurs with the Sogdians. Lastly, fifth was nomads building their own urban centers and producing their own goods and materials. Most notable example of this was the Uyghur capital of Ordu Balik, which was reported by Arab explorers in the 9th century as being a great city, rich in agriculture and surrounded by districts full of cultivation and villages lying close together. The city has 12 iron gates of huge size, the city is also populous and thickly crowded and has markets and various traders. Through archaeology we can also gleam that the city had sizable hinterlands which focused on production of goods most certainly to fulfill the needs of the nomadic polity. Of course, none of these five ways of acquiring goods and materials were mutually exclusive and all these so solutions were used interchangeably by various nomadic groups. With all that said, there is a very good reason why when it comes to the Eurasian steppe nomads, the nomadic aspect of their life is so often overemphasized by people talking about their history. This mostly happens because the nomadic life is what made the nomads so unique and it is the thing that gave them the edge over their sedentary counterparts. Their lifestyle was the reason why the Eurasian nomads were time and time again so influential in Eurasian history. The nomadic lifestyle forced the people of the steppe to become very good at horse riding, archery and be self-sufficient for long periods of time. As discussed, they still needed goods and materials from sedentary people, but they could live without these things for far longer than any other sedentary people could. All these skills, which the nomads learned in the steppe, coincidentally also made them skilled and efficient warriors. They were perfect soldiers for military campaigns as they could mobilize and traverse great distances in a short amount of time. On top of that, the fact that a nomadic lifestyle required the involvement of everyone in the nomadic society meant that despite smaller population numbers, the nomads of the Eurasian steppe could field just as large armies as their much more populous sedentary neighbors. Almost everyone in the nomadic society could be a skilled warrior if needed. Therefore, it was the nomadic lifestyle that empowered the Eurasian nomads to be so influential in Eurasian history and that is why their nomadic life is often emphasized in most literature about them, which, however, overshadows the more nuanced reality. The reality being that most early medieval Eurasian nomads did live a nomadic life which, however, was not self-sufficient, not stagnant and not devoid of farming or urban centers as is often thought. Just as any people, the nomads were pragmatic and when needed they could settle and farm or build cities to centralize power or abandon all this and start herding again. Thank you everyone for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it, and special thanks to my deity tier patron Tonuka. Uh, I know it took long to finish this video, I apologize, but hopefully stuff will start to pick up, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I, I do plan to make more videos, definitely, it's just sometimes real life gets in the way. But yeah, if you like this video, uh, stick around for history.